Honorable President of India, Sri Pranav Mukherjee, and dear YFLO members, it is indeed a dream come true for me and all our members present here today to be in your esteemed presence. A big thank you from the Young Fikki Ladies Organization in honoring us by hosting us at the Rashtrapati Bhavan today. We are immensely grateful to you, sir, for taking time out of your busy schedule. Sir, your contribution in building this nation will be written in golden letters. A true statesman, and one of the best parliamentarians in the country, you have served the nation in every capacity. Every ministry you've headed has benefited from your immense knowledge and expertise. Having won recognition both in India and abroad, you are a true inspiration to us all. With your permission, sir, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce the Young Fikki Ladies Organization. Swami Vivekananda said, and I quote, it is impossible to think about the welfare of the world unless the condition of women is improved. It is impossible for a bird to fly only on one wing. This more or less has been the guiding principle for YFLO. There have always been various federations for commerce and industry for men. It was only in 1983 that the Fiki Ladies Organization was launched. As the women's wing of Fiki, it provided a similar platform, especially to women entrepreneurs and professionals. Young Fiki Ladies Organization, or YFLO, as it is popularly known, was launched in 2004 to specially cater to women in the age group of 20 to 39. The main objective of YFLO is to encourage and facilitate inclusion of young women's talents, skills, experience, and energies across all sectors and levels of economic activity. It endeavors to make women aware of their strengths through its educational and vocational training programs, talks, seminars, panel discussion, and workshops on a vast range of subjects, especially concerning women and business. YFLO Delhi has 350 members, comprising of entrepreneurs, professionals, and executives. Besides Delhi, we have chapters active in Mumbai, Hyderabad, Kolkata, and Ahmedabad. We at YFLO believe in the power of women and that we can achieve anything when given the right opportunities. We work endlessly to provide that confidence and knowledge to empower them. Working at grassroots level, our skilling programs make women more employable and also help them set up their own entrepreneurial ventures. At the senior level, the organization helps promote women in leadership and board positions. We are also deeply committed in our endeavor to give back to society. We are hopeful that our little steps will result in giant leaps in the coming years. Sir, I would like to share with you a few CSR projects undertaken by YFLO Delhi this year. Education of women plays a vital role in shaping a society. It is said that if you educate a man, you educate an individual. But if you educate a woman, you educate an entire generation. Education of the girl child finds additional emphasis in our programs. YFLO has sponsored first generation learners from villages through the Isha Vidya rural schools. They provide high quality school education to underprivileged rural children who cannot otherwise access or afford it. The Vaiflo Silai Saheli tailoring project was started in May this year in the rural village of Basai in Haryana. Here we run two courses on stitching and fashion designing for a period of six months for underprivileged girls. The objective is to train disadvantaged women to enable them to earn an income either by self-employment or by securing employment using their tailoring skills. In a year, we will skill 100 underprivileged girls. Under Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, we have conducted various health and sanitation workshops for young children in three government primary schools in the villages of Nathupur, Fatehpur, and Jakampura around Delhi. Through these workshops, we engaged children from the lower socio-economic backgrounds and emphasized on the practical ways to keep them healthy. Relevant information on toilet hygiene, dental health, and other basics like the importance of washing hands and healthy eating was provided. Almost 600 children have been sensitized via the health and sanitation workshops. 
Viflo Delhi launched Gift a Sweater campaign in the month of October. We collected a revenue of 10 lakhs from generous members and non-members and provided around 9,500 sweaters to the underprivileged through various NGOs in Delhi to help the children cope with the harsh Delhi winters. Viflo has tied up with the Delhi Council for Child Welfare and taken care of their Gadaipur Centre. We have constructed a concrete roof and completely refurbished the centre, making it clean, inviting and child-friendly. Through our project, Vaiflo Vatika, we have created a secure Anganwadi for children of the labourers in this area. We are working with the Delhi Council for Child Welfare at the Gram Panchayat level to convert this Anganwadi into a primary school to impart quality education to these underprivileged children. Sir, we know that you have been an ardent supporter of women and their rights. You have always encouraged endeavours related to women succeeding in the world they choose to inhabit. We are truly honoured to have been hosted by you. Being in your presence is an unforgettable and momentous occasion for all of us at Viflo, the memories of which will last us a lifetime. Sir, I now invite you to inspire us with your words of wisdom. Thank you. Good morning. Ms. Tripti Gupta, your person. Young Faculty Ladies Organization, Ms. Anchal Shetty, Vice President, Vice Chairperson, Young Faculty Ladies Organization, members of <coughs> Young Faculty Ladies Organization. I welcome you to Rashtrapati Bhavan this morning. As you know, this Rashtrapati Bhavan was constructed by the Britishers. At the time of the height of British imperial power, after winning the First World War against Germany, and before the Second World War began, is the period in which this house, located on Raisina Hills, exercised high imperial power over the whole Indian subcontinent and also a part of Gulf regions up to Aden, entire Singapore, Myanmar, which was then called Burma, and Ceylon, which is now called Sri Lanka. These were the territories over which the British Governor General exercised his authorities as supreme administrator on behalf of the imperial British power. Those are part of the stories, but in the contemporary period also we have noticed this building has witnessed many important events, not only marking the end of the British rule over 190 years, at the stroke of midnight of 14th, 15th August, but also after three years of independence, declaration of the Republic and promulgation of the Constitution, which in fact is the basic act made by Indians themselves, by their assembly, after 190 years. Because when the large part of India were under the subjugation, of East India Company, who was authorized by the British sovereign to rule this territory as their agent. The legislative power was confined mainly to the British Parliament, and very limited power were given to the British Indian legislatures. But within the framework of the constitution framed by the British Parliament, whether Act of 1905, whether Act of 1919, or whether Act of 1935. Prior to that, there was no regular Act of Parliament passed by British Parliament, but there were some decrees which were occasionally issued 
by the British sovereign and were implemented by Governor General as representative of the British sovereign. I am glad to invite you to this historic building. First of all, I would like to congratulate you for your enthusiasm and encouragement to a cause which is very dear to every Indian. Ms. Gupta, in her observations, quoted Swami Vivekananda. And it is aptly correct that without empowerment of the women, the circle of the civilization will not be complete. And I do believe truly that without the women empowerment, the process of democratization of the society, democracy is just not an instrument of administration, but it is a culture which affects the lives of individuals and society at the same time. If any society fails to respects its women, hardly that society could be called a civilized society. Essential ingredients of civilization is the respect for women. Therefore, as you have undertaken certain programs, keeping in view of empowerment of the women, which is oft quoted. But how this empowerment is possible? The first and foremost ingredient of empowerment is education. If we can educate them, they will understand the problems, their positions in the context of the social situation, socio-economic perspective, which are prevailing for the time being. And the consciousness, awareness will develop in themselves. Therefore, this is the first element which is most important. Second element is to make them economically independent and supportive. Of course, it is very difficult But at the same time, it is equally essential. It is unfortunate. And this is not for the first time I am saying to this distinguished ladies group, but in one of my budget speech in parliament, during the discussion of the budget, I mentioned that it is unfortunate that there is no mechanism in which we can put the contribution of the women they are making by their services by their domestic services, by their various activities, in running their households. What is the economic value of it is never calculated into the GDP of the country, where we take the factors which are produced in factory and field and contribute it as the national income but the contribution of the women through their services is not accounted for in economic terms. It is high time that the concept of these should be changed. And the third element, which we have been able to do by law, but so far the law and legal right is concerned, there are two aspects. One is the legal framework, which has been completed by the enactment of the Constitution and subsequently under the Constitution, various laws for the protection of the women and their rights, so that they can live a dignified life in the society by their own rights not because of grace. 
So if these three elements could be achieved, education, then economic, independence, and effective implementation of their legal rights. And if you can create a social awareness, irrespective of the social status or, or income of their husbands or of their family, then you will be able to address the issues directly. It requires the involvement of the, all sections of the society. It is a social movement. Unfortunately, it has taken longer time in the history of this country. In other parts of the world, though there were Despite the legal dictum that there is no discrimination, but in many a field in our lives, we find that there are discriminations. And those discriminations are implanted in the mind, what you may sometimes describe as male chauvinism, or whatever nomenclature it may be given. Otherwise, I do not find any reason which we consider as the model of the democracy and where people of the government, by the government and for the government were established after the American War of Independence in 1785. Until today, no woman has become the president of America. British system is called the father of, a mother of parliamentary democracy. But in their democracy itself, from the days of Robert Walpole in 1746 till 1980s, almost more than 250 years it took to have a woman prime minister in Margaret Thatcher. And because of some work of historical developments, another woman has become the president, Prime Minister of England. Therefore, the point which I am trying to drive at, it is one thing to say, and it is another thing to do, to implement of all the legal provisions, to do away the prejudices, to come out of the mental frame which has been nourished over the centuries. How many years ago Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar in his social reforms, practically starting from Raja Ramohan Rai, we are talking of the emancipation. But where it started the movement, even there, we have not been able to implement it fully. No doubt, social movement is required to have the major social reforms that can simply not be done by legislations. Because acceptability of a legislation is an important factor. Widow remarriage was introduced long ago. But still, the full societal acceptance we do not find. I am not talking of the elite classes, but taking the masses as a whole, where the 50% of the population is women. I am not just going exactly by the census reports, approximately. Therefore, these are the aspects which you shall have to think of. I congratulate you and wish you success in your movement. But I would like to emphasize on one aspect, that this should not be tokenism. 
try to build it up as a form of social movement by yourselves and avoid tokenism because tokenism leads us to live in a make belief world that we are doing something very great and substantial which in fact is not so education child care relief all these are important but what is most important and i am happy that young fakey leaders association ladies association have taken it up that is the women movement and it is the true women liberty if you can achieve your objective for which you have started your job i wish you all success it is a long and arduous journey but i do believe if you have commitment success will be yours thank you ladies today is a memorable day in the history of yflo for we have been blessed to be in the venerable company of someone who has enriched our nation with great vision and intellect with a finer spirit of hope and achievement someone whose life journey is synonymous with the evolution of modern india someone whose versatility and wisdom in a career spanning six decades can only inspire us more each day your excellency honorable president of india we as the young women of fiki and most importantly young mothers promise to strive and further your idea of an educated equitable and tolerant nation and i quote your excellency to create an impatient india an innovative india and an inclusive india please accept our heartfelt gratitude for your enlightened presence and guidance jai hind